So the, the color hagarola didn't arrive until partway through the first week. Oh. So in the beginning, we were using uh, old stuff, but since then, it's <laughs> yeah. I was just standing here thinking about how once upon a time, you know, decades ago, oh. everyone's watch was a little different and the clocks in the room were a little different. And now we know wow. exactly when it's... Uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, sure. All right, so we can continue with our afternoon lectures and we'll get back to thinking about gap phases and TQFTs. Okay. All right. Um, so I want to first make a couple of clarifications. The last part of the last few minutes of uh, the presentation was you know, rushed a bit. So, um, so I wrote down two theories, but let, let me actually write one theory. So parameterized by omega and manifold, a triangulated manifold, sum over and product over Trahegians and the omega factors, All right? So that was a theory. There is a sigma depend on the. Okay, so this this thing also depend on. Okay, and um, this state sum this state sum depends on omega. Sum depend on omega, and if you pick different omega, or more precisely, if you pick different equivalent classes of omega, you get different TKFTs. So if you pick omega equals one, that's uh, the one that um, I wrote first, where you just have one here. Okay. In a way, in this case, the action of a series is completely trivial, just zero. But here, there's some topological action. All right, and these are state sums. So, you no. Know, <clears throat> As written, right, you have some local degree of freedom. There's some uh, local stuff. These are the Gs. Okay? And the only thing that we impose is that the G have to satisfy the flatness condition, but we still have lots of configuration they can sum over. Okay? Um, so once you evaluate this guy on a manifold, you do get a topological invariant. But this is a subtle difference between a state sum and the TKFT. That is, uh, it's not quite a TKFT yet, as it has lots of local degree of freedom. But we'll see that you know, the TKFT emerges um, as you look at the theory carefully. Okay. All right, so I also did a computation about the matrix element of a time evolution operator uh, in this form, where this is the time direction, and uh, sigma is a spatial manifold. 
which is now a surface, a triangulated surface. So there's some triangulation on this surface. And the top bottom has the same triangulation. Okay. And the Hilbert space, the vector space I put on this surface is not a TKFT Hilbert space. It's an enlarged Hilbert space that has all these labels, the G labels, on the edges on the surface. So this is more like, you no, know, we actually have some kind of QFT. Okay? It, although it's a very special just QFT defined only on discrete high space time, um, but it's, it's not quite a TQFT yet. Okay? And we compute this matrix element. And let me write down the matrix element. So schematically, there is an evolution operator, but this computation is really just evaluating the partition function the state sum, but now with open boundaries, the top and boundary, we fix these G labels to be G and G prime. So we compute the partition function with this boundary, labels fixed. Okay. If you think of G as a gauge field, in some sense we are gauge fixing these G labels. And the result, uh, as I claimed, is going to be equal to a product of um, well, so as an operator, okay, so this, I should. So if you view this as an operator on this Hilbert space with the obvious <coughs> uh, basis given by these Gs, then it's equal to this product of local projectors, okay, and now let me actually write down the expression of this local projector as A of I is equal to 1 over G, sum over um, H for G and this operator is A of I H, okay, where A of I H is defined as following. So for, it, for the vertex I, Suppose you have uh, G, G1, G2, G3, and sum over all the Gs, you should get on the other side uh, H of G1, H of G2, and H of G3. Okay, so this is what the operator does. You can see that it basically implements gauge transformations. And once we quotient out these gauge transformations, you get the actual Hilbert space of the gauge theory on the spatial slice. All right, so this is the generator of the local gauge transformation. And Hamiltonian, once you, um, and we observe that this is a projector, so we can prove that they are all commute and square to one. I mean, it's easy to see that square to one because the matrix element um, has only zero and one values and, and they all commute with each other on different vertices. Okay, so we can get a Hamiltonian, we can write this as a Hamiltonian form where the Hamiltonian terms are just sum over AIs. Okay. We can see that these are equivalent because you know, we have these commuting projectors. Okay. All right. Now, it's kind of quite common in the, at least in the condensed matter literature, to lift all the constraints that we input on these Hilbert space. So here, the only constraint that even on the surface, we also have a flatness condition, right? On each surface triangle, we also have a flatness condition. No, zero, one, two. G12, G20 is one. It's applied everywhere in the bulk. On the surface, we also have this flatness condition. And it's convenient to also impose that flatness condition as an energetic condition. Okay, so let me define a different operator, B of F, that basically computes how much flux you have inside the triangle. So it's going to be diagonal on the Hilbert space. So it's going to be diagonal. So it's a 
delta function that you know, enforces this operator to be diagonal, and then another delta function to enforce a flux of this phase, f. So f is a phase. Just say that f is one of these phase, 0, 1, 2, and 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0 equals 1. So I'm going to define this operator that just measures whether you have one flux or not. Okay. And I'm going to add this to the Hamiltonian, but now on a completely unconstrained Hilbert space. Hilbert space, where you just put some G label on each link, on each edge, without imposing any further constraints. Okay, so the whole Hilbert space is like the G state space on each link, the tensor product over all of them. Right. And this Hamiltonian is oftentimes known as uh, Kitaev's quantum double Hamiltonian. Um, quantum double model. <clears throat> we can think of it as basically a lattice gauge theory where all of these gauge structures put in by energetics, not imposed directly on the Hilbert space. This imposes a gauge structure, this imposes a flatness, so you get a topological gauge theory. All right, so why are we doing all this? I mean, you can to some extent, you can analyze directly a, a gauge theory without necessarily going through this, uh, you know, the state sum and Hamiltonian. Um, one thing is that, well, when G is a general finite group, um, I'm not sure how one can write down like a continuum action for G, for G gauge theory. For Z2, you just get the BF. Well, or for Zn, you get BF. Um, I think that's what the BF means. Um, for other groups, finite group, non abelian finite group, it's not clear how to write a continuum action for this. And the most, oh, uh, <coughs> at least to me, the, the easiest thing to do is just to pick a triangulation and write the lattice gauge theory. Okay. All right. Um, the reasons to do this that it will allow us to analyze what happens um, on manifolds, on spatial manifolds with defects with a Hamiltonian, okay. All right, so, but let's first think about how to actually go from this Hamiltonian to TKFT. So, we start from a state sum, and we have a Hamiltonian, which is not zero, it has these terms, and these terms satisfy some nice properties that these are projectors, all of them are projectors, and they all commute, all commute with each other. Okay, so it's a commuting project Hamiltonian. Because they all commute, you can easily solve them. Just pick the eigenvalue, just so, no, pick the eigenvalue of each of these operators, sum them up. That's a spectrum of the theory, the entire spectrum of the theory. And because they are projected, the eigenvalue are zero one. Okay, so. Um, the spectrum of the theory is completely fixed. And the ground state, in particular, the ground state, the ground state will have A of all, on all vertices equal to 1, just to minimize the energy. It takes value of 1, 0, and B of F equal to 1. Okay. So this is the ground state Hamiltonian. And you flip one of them to 0, you get excited state, etc. Now, this ground state, so you go, to, you go from state sum to some lattice model with a Hamiltonian, and then we go to a ground state. This ground state is a ground state, is a vector space of the TKFT. Um, it's a TKFT vector space associated with a manifold sigma. Okay. All right. So... We're going to see what these ground states actually look like. Um, but let's first do it in a situation that you know, doesn't involve any topology. For example, let's imagine you have a two-sphere 
and you pick some triangulation or two sphere, okay, and, and do this. Okay. What the ground state looks like. So the ground state wave function, let me call it psi of zero, will be basically, um, okay, so let me not normalize it, just sum over all the configurations of G. This always means a collective kind of you know, collection of G labels that satisfy the flatness condition because we want BF equals one on every phase, so you know, it should satisfy the flatness condition. And sum over all the basis states. Oh, that's a proportional, sorry. <laughs> All right, it's not infinity. I guess we don't really like infinities uh, in quantum field theory. We try very hard to get rid of them. Um, I mean, there's a normalization factor which I've, uh, yeah, I think we can actually put it in if you really want. And zero is a number of vertices on the sphere, on the triangulation of the sphere. Okay. So it's an equal weight superposition of all these different Know, G configurations that satisfy the flatness condition. And that's a ground state wave function of this Hamiltonian. Okay. And that's a state we assign to this sphere by this state sum TQFT. I mean, it's not really a TQFT yet, but no. This is a vector that we assign to a sphere. That's a unique ground state on a sphere. Okay. All right. Um, now, what about other manifolds? So, Let's consider, for example, a torus. Okay. Let's consider a torus. Now, to discuss the ground state space of these Hamiltonians, it's, at this point, it's, let's actually bring back the gauge theory intuitions. Okay. So this Hamiltonian is really just the version of lattice gauge theory where the um, gauge constraints, the Gauss laws, are imposed energetically. If you look at the ground states, the gauss claus constraints are precisely enforced and flatness conditions is enforced, then we're really just looking at flat G bundles on this manifold. Okay. And we know for a gauge theory, for a discrete gauge theory, the only thing that you need to care about are Wilson loops. Okay. So let's now define Wilson loops. So we pick some pass on the lattice, pick some pass, and then call it gamma. Gamma is my pass on the lattice. And choose some starting point on the pass. So it's an oriented pass. And pick some starting point, the base point. Okay. And we're going to define the Wilson loop operator as basically um, now I'm doing it actually on the spatial manifold. We're going to, <clears throat> I'm going to define this operator. Okay, let me actually define a slightly more general version of the operator. So I'm going to put a label H and Gamma and um, acting on some basis state, sorry. Acting on some basis state G, and it's going to calculate basically whether the product of the edges along this path, so there are many edges along this path. Remember, we, had, we have discretized space time, and the G on these edges, whether that equals H or not. Okay, let me define this as my Wilson. Now, the state space on the, for example, on the torus will be characterized by these different Wilson loops. You know, these are the only gauging random observables on the torus, for example, on this manifold. Okay. And it doesn't depend on the choice of gamma. I mean, as, as, at least when you fix the base point, it doesn't really depend on the choice of gamma. If you pick a different gamma, the difference between them is a product of these phase operators, the difference between them. We can fill in by some product of the faces in between. 
and we know they are all equal to one in the ground state. So the expectation value of this Wilson loop, at least when you restrict to the ground state, doesn't depend on which path you pick. We also know that if you choose a different base point, it's just the same as conjugating this H, globally conjugating all H. Okay. So the state space, the ground state space, is parameterized by these Wilson loops, the value of the Wilson loops along the various loops on the torus. F gamma is contractible. For example, if your if our gamma is a contractible loop, which means that we can actually fill in this loop, then we expect that the Wilson loop is going to be one, just because you know, we can shrink it to a point. And or it's equal to all the product BFs inside. So we just need to worry about the Wilson loops that are not contractible. And that, if that comes from pi one of this manifold. Okay. So what we really have here is a map from pi one to, to G. For each pi one, we can calculate the value of Wilson loop, and that is going to be an element in the group G, the gauge group G. Okay. And this is supposed to be a homomorphism because we can multiply the Wilson loops, we can join these two Wilson loops starting from the same base point, and just define the Wilson loop of the sum of these two loops exactly in the same way they are defined in the homotopy, the first, hom or first fundamental group. Okay. So this is the group homomorphism from pi one sigma to the group G. So I'm just going to write this is a group homomorphism from pi one of the manifold to G. And then we'll have to caution out um, the global gauge transformations, which will change the values of all of these Wilson loop by conjugation. Okay. Caution out by global conjugation. And this is the actual state space of the Hilbert, of the TQFT, of this G gauge theory. Right. Okay. So if you do it on a sphere, just because there are no non-trivial, non-contractible loop, this is completely trivial. So you get one dimensional Hilbert space. That's a ground state that we just wrote down. On the torus, well, we know the pi one for torus when pi one of T2 is z cross z, okay? So for each generator of the loop, we know that this is one generator, this is the second generator. For each generator, we assign a value of g. That's a value that's gonna be the value of the Wilson loop, but because it's z cross z, these two group elements should commute. And then we mod out conjugation, you know, conjugating both of them by the same group element, and that's gonna be the Hilbert space, the dimension of the Hilbert space of, uh, of this theory. Sorry, that's a Hilbert space of the theory on torus. Okay. Um, and you can do it for you know, higher genus surface. For each surface, we assign some vector space in this way as a ground state space of the Hamiltonian, and we get a TKFT. Okay. All right, so this is an this is example of how you actually go from some lattice model. So we actually have a lattice model. Even though we start from a state sum, we have a lattice model to a TKFT at least, no, the two cavity vector space. Um, usually it's not that easy, right? You, you start from some interacting QFT and you flow to Lorange and you try to figure out what the, you know, the Lorange space are, it, it's not that easy. Here, what makes it really easy is because all of these terms commute, all of these terms commute and they are projectors, but we can basically solve it without doing any work. And these properties really come from the fact that we start from a state sum TQFT. You know, it's a state sum, it's not some arbitrary QFT, it's a state sum that is topologically invariant. And one can show, even though I'm not going to do it, that these properties flow from the fact that you, you start with a state sum. Okay. Um, there are many other state sum constructions of TQFT, and they all give you commuting projector Hamiltonians like this. Hamiltonian, the sum of the projectors, they all commute. And in a sense, this Hamiltonian is already at a fixed point. 
it's already at the RG fixed point. You don't need to do anything else. You can just directly work with Hamiltonian and read out the ground state subspace. That's going to be the TKFT vector space. All right. Um, any questions? Yes. Why is pi one instead of Why is it pi one? Well, so we assign these loops. We assign values of uh, um, g to these loops, right? And g is in general not a billion. And they multiply as you multiply the loops. And that multiplication is not necessarily commutative. So it's really pi one because we really assign to each loop a value in G. And they will multiply following the, no, just joining the paths in pi one. G is just some finite group. It's not necessarily abelian. I mean, when it's abelian, this is, this is the same as H1. The result of this harm um, is the same as H1. But in general, it's not. Yes. All right. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, this is gauging. All right. right. So um, this is like. So can you say that again? So if I want to think of it as a gauge theory, I'm gauging. I have a gauge field G, yeah. and it's coupled to basic a vector. That's what I. Mm -hmm. It has a symmetry. Oh, oh. That's a point dragon dual. Right, right. It's a gauge theory. I think you are talking about this rep G. In this case, a one form symmetry. Right. Is, that, is that what you have in mind? The rep G type. This is, um, I can see this case from the Fourier transform. Right. Yeah, I think for in general for non-building groups, the, the Fourier transform is a rep G. You, you'll get rep G. Yes, yes. <laughs> right. Oh. Also, in in two three D, there are more symmetries. Yes, um, but yeah, in general, you get rep G. Okay, all right. Um, so this is example of a three D TKFT that, you know, in some sense, the simplest kind. Okay. So now I want to. Um, start generalizing this a bit to kind of abstractly define what a 3D TKFT looks like. Okay. Yes. Oh, let's do it in, the, in this case. So, um, so for the two generators, let's say we have uh, the one generator, the, the longitudinal one, this is a longitudinal meridian. So I'm going to map the longitudinal to some GL and the meridian to some GM. And they should commute. So this, what this equation means here is that they should commute. You pick all such commuting pairs of G. And we identify, for example, GL, GM pair with HG, um, L, H inverse, H, G, M, Inverse. So we conjugate all of them, right? Because that, that you can do, for example, just by changing the base point. Okay. So and so you pick these commuting pairs and quotient out this relation. That's that's one to one correspondent with the states on the um, on the torus. I mean, like you can you can pick a different base point, but that's just changing this uh, um, Wilson loop by conjugation. For a non-abelian group, you have to pick some base point. Uh, do I have another board? Or... All right. So uh, with this example, let's now try to generalize a little bit. So remember, uh, we have some data that we like to assign to manifolds for TKFT. 
And let's now fix the dimension to be three. I'm gonna skip in the two dimensional TKFT. Also, um, because here this, this is where you see like the, at least a little bit of the force structure. Okay. All right, so remember the data that we want to assign is a partition function for the time manifold and vector space for vector space for two manifolds, and then for each open manifold, you should get a state. Okay. Now, uh, fortunately, we understand the topology of two manifolds pretty well, right? So, oriented two manifolds, and we know these are just you know, higher genus surfaces, sphere, torus, uh, genus two with a bunch of handles, et cetera. So, but there are still infinite number of them labeled by the genus. It's Gina G surfaces. So naively, it looks like we have to assign infinite amount of data, even though we have a TKFT, right? you know, the claim that we just need finite amount of data. But even in this case, in 3D, because there are diff infinite many, at least you know, manifolds in topological classification, we have to specify what each of them does. Okay? And we, don't, we do not like to work with infinite amount of data like to have something more compact. Okay. And apparently within this relation of uh, TKFT, the, the original atia Sego formulation, you know, just looks like we have, we need to supply a lot of information. Okay. And that's, a, I believe, the part of the motivation to introduce extended TKFTs, one extended TKFT, that we can truncate this infinite amount of data that we that naively we needed to describe all of this stuff to a finite amount. So what do I mean by extended TKFT here? Okay. So, so far we have something associated with closed three manifolds, and that's a partition function, and we have something associated with open three manifold, that's a state, and for closed two manifolds, Sigma two, we have a vector space, we have V. Okay. Now, the natural thing to add to this list is what happens to open two manifolds. Two manifolds with boundaries, or with, no, with boundaries. Okay. What is? Now, the boundary of two manifolds are also very simple. They're just circles. Right? You take two manifolds, you have circles as boundaries. So the question here is really, what do we assign to a circle? No. What information we need on a circle in order to define this TQFT? Equivalently, we want to know what happens on open two manifolds. And once we have that information, we can start playing this cut and glue game again, because the arbitrary you know, genus G manifolds always look like always look like this. Um, we can keep going. And we can start chopping them. If we know what to do with open two manifolds, we can start chopping this manifold into small pieces, which we actually know what to do. For example, we can chop it like this. Okay. And now each of the piece, and you get just a small number, handful of different pieces that will build up any two manifolds, such as the cylinder here. You have a pair of pants, right? You're basically using pair of pants, disks, Sitting there is you'll be able to build any two manifolds you like. Okay. So that's a reason to do one extended TKFT in this case, because I like to kind of truncate this down to a finite amount of data. All right. Yeah. So I, I don't understand what, the, what, the, what you mean by one extended. Like what was the one extension? Oh, one extension just means that, no, here we, this is no extension. This is zero extended in some sense. We just have information on closed three manifolds and closed two manifolds. One extended means now we further specify what happens on one manifold, circles. Yeah. And in, in principle, we can go down further and ask what happens to a point. Um, you can go to a point, this is a circle. Okay. And that will be two extended. In this case, it will be fully extended because you cannot go down further. Um, but we don't need that. We just need to 
extend it to circle. All right. OK, so what do we do on the circle? Um, and let's imagine, so I'm going to draw some schematic picture. So we have some manifold. Let's say this is a sphere. And we put a bunch of circles. OK. It's better to think of these circles as not as like you know, four fledged boundaries, but as punctures. Just make a little puncture here, a, a defect. So, so instead of boundaries, I'll say punctures just to distinguish it from the actual boundary conditions of the TQFT. That's a, that's a separate issue. We just have punctures. Okay. Now, we need to assign some data to these punctures. Okay. We assign some data. And in the spirit of TQFT, you know, the idea that we want to have finite information. So let's say on this puncture, we will just assign some label set that kind of tells, you, tells us what happens on, the, on this puncture. And this label set come from some finite set of labels. So let's say this is A, this is B, this is C, et cetera. Okay. All right, so we have some finite label set, which I'll schematically denote as C. So there's some A, B, C. These are the set of labels that we like to put on, on these um, punctures. Okay. And we'll have to figure out you know, what exactly the structure that I need to impose on these label set in order to, to make a TKFT out of this. And now we need to extend axioms from you know, just um, these two. We have talked about some axioms that really only involve datum at this level. But now I'm going to extend the axioms to include these punctures. Okay. So I'm not going to list the axioms. I'm just going to you know, kind of review them as we go, uh, as they are all very physically motivated. Okay. All right. OK, so where should, we, where should we start? Well, there is one particular label. There's a special label that just, you just fill in this puncture by whatever the theory, you just fill in that puncture, okay? And that means you don't have any puncture. So we'll call that label one. So that's a special label in the theory, which means filling in the hole, all right? So among this label set, there is a distinguished element that is one, and A, B, et cetera, okay? And we still want to assign a vector space to this manifold with punctures, okay? So, so there's a special label one, and then for a manifold with various punctures labeled by A, B, C, et cetera, we still want to have a vector space. So there's a vector space associated with a punctured surface. Now, the simplest thing we can imagine is a disk or a two-sphere with bone puncture. Okay. And, or I can think of it as two-sphere with a single puncture here. So we can have an A label. I'm going to <clears throat> assume, basically, in some sense as a part of the axiom, that this vector space is trivial when the label is different from the distinguished one element. And if we fill in that puncture is just a sphere, so we know it's a one-dimensional vector space. That's another part of the axiom. Okay. Now, this point, you, know, you might be a little confused what exactly these uh, labels are. So if we think about a space-time picture of these punctures, what, what we really have is, is the following picture. So you know, imagine you have some surface with a bunch of punctures. Well, where do these additional punctures, where do these labels come from? When you have these labels, really mean that you have non-trivial line operators, line defect in the theory that pass through these punctures. And these line defects are labeled by these, well, these, these, line, these, these line operators or line defects are labeled 
So secretly, these punctures are labeled by the Wilson line that you know, the threads through these punctures. And you cannot have just Wilson line passing through a sphere once unless that Wilson line is completely trivial. Yes, please. I really mean the empty set. I mean, this is a one-dimensional Hilbert space. Yeah, there's no state when you have a non-trivial label. Yes. Yeah. So you said that um, uh, these labels kind of uh, take into account whether or not the Wilson line is going through them. Mm -hmm. Um, counting, so the, the question is um, whether we can think of the labels as counting of Wilson lines. Well, they are labels of the Wilson line. Now, the full structure of these labels <coughs> is not finite. There are actually infinite number of labels, but we are picking out a basis of the labels at the simple objects of uh, the Wilson lines, the simple Wilson lines. Okay. Wilson lines that cannot be decomposed further into direct sums basically. And these are the labels. And any other Wilson lines can be you know, expressed as direct sum of these simple Wilson lines. Okay. okay. Right, so it's useful to you know, bring that intuition in that these labels are basically labels of the Wilson lines or the line defects of the theory. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm confused about the dimension counting. Yeah. Well, so I guess I can maybe draw a better picture that you, know, you have a sphere and then we just make a little puncture. There's one puncture, and we cut out this little disk. Yeah. Yes. So this hole from the axioms, that's the, the space of the sphere is one dimensional. Okay, so um, the TKFT axiom does not require one dimensionality of Hilbert space on the a vector space on sphere, but we'll impose that. Okay, so that's something I, I should have uh, said earlier that for all the TKT we're going to do, um, what's a good place to write that? Maybe just here. That we're going to assume the vector space on the sphere, in this case two sphere, is one dimensional. I'm going to make that as an assumption. And this agrees with our intuition about you know, the state operator correspondence because on the sphere, you're really looking at local operators by the state operator map. And in the TKFT, there shouldn't be any local operator other than the identity. So it's natural to impose that there's just a one-dimensional Hilbert space on sphere. Okay, so what are the other axioms? Do we just put in more and more punctures and see what happens? So what's uh, next thing? Next thing is a, sp a, a sphere with two punctures. Or you can say it's just a cylinder. Topologically, it's the same as a cylinder. And again, we, as we imagine, let me, let me draw it as, as uh, let me draw it vertical. Okay. In principle, we cut A and B as labels. Two punctures have some label. And we have a vector space associated with this cylinder, go between A and B. Okay. It's a vector space. So I'll write it as uh, anticipating that we're going to get a category, so I'm going to write it as home space or morphisms from A to B. But this here is just a notation. Now, once you have this cylinder Hilbert space, the categorical structure starts to kind of reveal them itself, because now you can start composing them. You can compose this cylinder with another cylinder, and that defines 
the composition of these morphisms. Okay. So we see a little bit of the, the structure of category here. That for these, from with two labels, we have a, a map. Well, map in quote between them, and you can compose these maps. So that makes it already a structure of a category, one category. In any case, we just have a home space, a spectral space associated with the cylinder, and I've here I've made just anticipating what you no know, what will come. I've chosen these labels to be the simple ones, which means that this vector space will be one-dimensional. F A is the same as B, and it will be empty. Otherwise, zero-dimensional vector space. And again, you can kind of see that from the picture of Wilson line because you know, there's a sphere with two punctures of the cylinder, so it's really just the Wilson line passing through the cylinder and has to be the same label. Okay. And this requirement of C being one dimensional when A could equal to B just means that these Wilson lines are simple, so they cannot be decomposing to, further into other simple Wilson lines. And if they are not the same, then this state just doesn't exist. All right. Okay, so now we can start the next thing. And I will see that's the last thing we need, at least to understand the vector space, is a sphere with three punctures. Um, I don't know, I, I, in all my, my notes I wrote, the, the pair of pants going this way. So I'm going to stick to that. This is a sphere with three punctures. And let's you know, also draw the schematically the Wilson lines. Something like this. So it's a fusion of Wilson lines, A, B, and C. Okay. And there's a vector space associated with this picture. And we just say that this is, we denote as A, B, C this way. Now, being able to draw this picture and assign a vector space to this picture already tells us a lot about what this label set should do. Okay. So first of all, I should be able to talk about what happens if I have two circles. Okay. Although physically the circles are always boundaries of these manifolds, I should be able to just talk about what happens if I have two circles. And the spirit of TKFT is that you know, when you have this strong union of two such manifolds, you should get something that like a tensor product. You should be able to make sense of what happens if you tensor A with B. Okay. And here we get another label, A, B, and C. And in general, you might get multiple different labels from this picture. So here is a tensor product, A cross B, and there are multiple outcomes of this tensor product. So each fixing this label, we have a vector space. So what we really mean that what it really means that this vector space, this structure of the labels, allow two operations. One is tensor product, just means that we should be able to talk about what happens if you put two circles together. And the other operations direct sum. We should be able to talk about direct sum of different labels. Because that's what happens. If you, even when you fix A and B, you might get multiple Cs. Each of them is associated with a vector, with a vector space. Okay. So this is going to be my notation. So this is defined to be the map. It's the same kind of vector space between a cross B, A tensor product B, that's just two circles, to C. And now we get a, basically we get a, a category with tensor product and with direct sum. So this structure basically follows from being able to you know, make sense of pictures like this. Yeah. And like in this last home, I should use the same definition as above as like A tensor B equals C, or like C should be in the tensor product of A with B? Well, so when C is not in the tensor product, it is just zero. 
Yeah, but, but, but now the de definition would be different, right? So like C should be like in the tensor product and not like be equal to. Oh, okay. See what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So um, if I understand your question, so if C is not in the tensor product of A and B, this is just zero dimension. Does that, is that satisfying? No, it's just because like above we have like an equality, A equals B, and I think like now we should have something like oh. C in A times B. That's right, that's right. So, yeah, okay, good. So, we'll just write a fusion rule of these lines, of these objects, that A times B is going to decompose into a direct sum of C's. And we'll write this just to, and this n a b c is a dimension of this Hilbert space. So this is kind of to kind of no, no, uh, to put this information in one equation. We'll say that this is a fusion rule. Of course, we should really remember that this is actually a vector space associated with a three puncture sphere. And here we just recall the dimension of the vector space. That's all we need to know about the vector space. Um, in higher dimensions, when you have other extended objects, this, this guy here might not just be a simple vector space, it might have more structures. But, but in this case, because we really just have a vector space, so we just need to recall this dimension. So we write this fusion. Is that equality with respect to um, Yes, it's always means isomorphism yeah. in the category. All right, and um, I think you have seen a similar structure before in Yifan's lecture of 2D CFT, where you, where you have line operators representing the generalized global symmetries in the 2D CFT, and you have these kind of fusion diagrams for these line operators, and the junction Hilbert space is this V. Okay, so the good news is that we don't need to go down further. Naively, we will have to specify what happens with four punctures, five punctures, etc. But with four punctures, we can we can start um, using the cut and glue. Okay, we can start doing the cut and glue. So this is a sphere with four punctures. C and D. Draw the picture a little better. All right. Now, I've discussed the cut and glue for partition functions. Okay. Um, but that's the only thing we can do in the you know, non extended TKFT, right? We can only discuss cut and glue for partition functions. But now we have a one extended TKFT, we can also cut open the spatial manifolds. So we have a version of cut and glue for spatial manifolds, which I'll illustrate using this example. So let's see, how are we going to figure out what's a structure, what's a vector space on this four puncture sphere? So we can try to cut it into chopped pieces that we already know. Um, and here's one way to chop it. Just cut it along this leg, and you'll get two three puncture sphere. Oh, sorry, three puncture sphere. Two pair of pants, one here and one here. Okay. Now the rule of the cut and glue for the vector space in this one extended TKFT is that we're going to get a direct sum of all possible labels, the simple ones, the labels in that label set. Over here, through this, this new puncture that you know, shows up when we cut it open, and let's call this uh, A, B, C, D, let's call it E. This is a new label that here, that shows up here. And then the vector space of the two pieces. Okay. So, A, B, E, the other piece is E, C, and D. And this is the strong union. 
So this is a kind of glue for, in this particular context, for vector space. And again, by the disjoint union axiom of TKP, we know this is just a tensor product of a two vector space, ECD. Okay, so we know how to decompose the vector space on a full puncture sphere into a direct sum of uh, the vector spaces here, the tensor product of these three puncture sphere vector space. Okay, so we know what we should do on the full puncture sphere. However, now there's a new ingredient. That is, we can cut it in different ways. We can also cut it in, uh, through the other leg. There's no reason not to do this. Okay. And let's say this is some label F. Okay. So just using the same method, we can represent the Hilbert space as following a different cut in, or following a different cut as V. Now it's AFD, AFD cross V, VCF. Again, they should be familiar from the 2D CFT discussion. Right? There are you know, different ways to represent the same sort of junction vector space if you have a picture like this. Okay. So pictorially, what we are doing is we have uh, some Wilson lines going in. And they meet at this point. And then there's another Wilson line that comes from A. So this is F, B, C, and comes out as D. And both of them should be the same vector space. This is a vector space assigned to a full puncture sphere. So both of them, first, they should be the same vector space. And they define what A, B, C, D means. This is a vector space assigned to this full puncture sphere. OK, so since these are the same vector space, there should be isomorphism between them. It's just a different decomposition, a different basis uh, for the different vector space. Okay. So um, I'm going to now draw the picture of the line, of the lines, not the always the puncture sphere. That's a bit easier. So we have one decomposition as this, A, B, E, C to D. We have another decomposition, which is uh, A, B, C, F, and also D. Okay. And remember, each of them is really a vector space. Okay. So they should be related by transformation going from one decomposition to another. To be more specific, we'll have to pick some bases for these uh, three puncture sphere bases. So let's say we pick some also normal bases of uh, VABC, and let's say it's mu. From For VABC, we can label them mu nu, um, lambda and delta. Okay. And then we have a basis transformation between this basis states and that basis states. Okay. And that's the F symbol, which I'll schematically write as F, A, B, C, E, F. Okay. But it's really the basis transformation between these two vector spaces. These two, the, the decomposition of the same vector space. Okay. Right? Um, it's kind of called F matrix or F symbol. OK, so, um, so this is what happens on the full puncture sphere. And you, can, you, you, might, want, you might start worrying you know, what happens on the sphere with more punctures, five puncture sphere, et cetera. Okay. As the number of punctures increase, the number of ways to cut them is also, in, also increases very quickly. Okay. For example, if you think about five puncture sphere, there are not only different ways to cut them, even when you have this F symbol that tell us how to relate these different ways of cutting the manifold, starting and ending from the same, um, draw it over here, so I don't need this. Starting and ending from the same 
Kanye. E. There are two different passes that you can go. Change the way you cut them, but eventually you return to the same cutting. Okay. For example, I can go from this picture, the particular cutting and glue for the five puncture sphere, to this one. Okay. And then I do another F move over here. Or I can first perform an F move. For this part of the diagram, and then do another F move for this part of the diagram, and finally, an F move over here. Okay. It's a, two different sequences of F moves, the F, you know, the changing of bases, starting and end at the same kind of. You know, Cutting of the manifold. Okay. And they should give you exactly the same result. And this is the Pentagon equation. Again, you probably have seen this before in the discussion of, uh, in Yifan's discussion of 2D CFTs. Right. All right. Now, now here's, uh, now, we, uh, now we can declare victory at least for the discussion of vector space because once we this, is, this can be proven, known as Maclean's coherence theorem, that once the F matrices or the F symbols, whatever you like to call it, satisfy the pentagon, uh, the pentagon is 2F here and 3F down here. It's a complicated polynomial equation involving the F symbols. Once they satisfy the pentagon equation, then you can be assured that the cut and glue is consistent on any sphere with any number of, uh, well, the sphere with any number of punctures. Okay. We just need to check the consistency of the puncture sphere. That's pentagon, and that's enough. Then you go to you know, six punctured or seven punctures, whatever, and you get consistent result. It doesn't depend on the way I cut them. Okay. All right, so this is, uh, this is the basic, yes. Well, when you look at four, you have two ways to cut them, right? So this issue of different cutting doesn't arise before four punctures. So four puncture is the first number where you have to worry about two different ways of cutting. And that defines the F symbol. And then you have to check that it's consistent on the, higher, uh, on the sphere with higher number of punctures. All right. Okay, so, so we have this additional information. This is F that tells us how to uh, relate two different cuttings on the full puncture sphere, and that's part of uh, TKFT data, yes. Yeah, this is the associator of the, of the fusion category, yes. You mean, how does this discussion change if we consider arbitrary surface with punctures? Uh, say, like on a torus, or if you're an empty puncture. Yeah, yeah. So first, you can cut a torus into a cylinder with a three puncture sphere. And then, you know, it's, it just reduces to the case of puncture sphere. Right, so basically, any manifold, two dimensional manifold, closed manifold, can be built out of puncture spheres. Right, it's just depending on, well, well, you have various different number of punctures and you glue them together, you get all kinds of uh, two manifolds. So thinking about that doesn't give new information, doesn't give new constraints. This is all I need. Now, um, I'm just going to mention this quickly. There's, uh, there's one special F symbol that's particularly simple. That is, let's say F this is one. If A is one, then just basically fill in this puncture. And this lag essentially doesn't exist because you can continuously shrink this lag and you just get three puncture sphere, right? So, and it's same, the same thing with any other punctures. So you can put these punctures, you can fill in one of these punctures and it just reduces to 
so you puncture sphere. So we're going to impose the condition that if that's the case, if one of these F symbol, not this one, if one of these F symbols, um, if, if one of these labels is identity, meaning that you can fill that hole in, then the F symbol should be trivial, for example. You don't have any, essentially the line doesn't exist, then it's the same picture. Um, one can do this more carefully and show that you can always do this, so, but we are, we're going to impose the condition that if any of these labels, if any of ABC is one, then the F is going to be just one. There's no non-trivial F symbol here. If one of them, if one of the ABC is one. All right. Um, any other questions before I go on? So it's, you differentiate the puncture from the through boundary, right? So that means yes. uh, you will a tensor product with a vector space on the, on the outer boundary to get the full vector space for the open You mean a, a true boundary? Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so I hope I'll have time to talk about boundary conditions, but I think Ibu will discuss examples of uh, TQFT with boundaries. Um, <clears throat> the discussion of boundary is a, is a separate issue. So uh, at, this, at this stage, let's just distinguish these two. So we're talking on punctures, not boundaries, especially not topological boundaries. Uh, that at least sometimes these two things might be confused. Yes. Yes, I'll, I'll get to that. Yes. You can also have that, right? They're all related. Yeah. So um, the redundancy is here. Right? When we write this F symbol, so I, I've read it. I've written it in kind of abstract form, but if you actually want to write down F symbol like numerically, you have to choose the basis. You choose spaces for each of these three punctured sphere. So you have to choose a basis for V in order to write down what the F symbol looks like. Okay. Now, there's a choice of basis here. And there's no canonical choice of basis. Even when it's one dimensional, you can always change it by a scalar. And that will change the F symbol in some case. If you choose different bases, the F symbol will look different. But no, it's the same F symbol. And that's a redundancy in the F symbol. Well, I can redefine. This is a local junction operator. I can redefine operator. Right. So, uh, how much redundancy is there in having been eliminated by setting that condition? When we choose this normalization convention, we've eliminated, for example, the the redundancy in this picture, and including including this picture. So we've we have no freedom in, in, in when we look at these vector space. I pick some canonical basis. But you're saying that for TQFTs, it's not necessary to introduce the F matrix when the fusion is not. Uh, well, so um, this is not finished yet. Oh, we'll, so we'll introduce more data, not just S matrix. We need to introduce the braiding data. Then that will allow us to define the TQFT in its full generality. Right. Right. Just to let you go about eight minutes. So. Okay, all right. Yeah, so now let me quickly, um, so there's a few details about uh, this vector space. So probably that's a good idea to go here. There are two additional issues I need to discuss. 
at least to complete this theory of fusion, um, or you know, how to think about vector space. And, yeah. okay. One thing that we've talked about pictures like this, two going in, one going out. Certainly, we can talk about, we should be able to, you know, you should know what happens on the other case. We have one coming in and two going out. And A, B, C, so the kind of uh, Wilson line picture is this. And here it's um, C, A, B. Okay. All right, so this is the vector space. This is A, B, C. This is the vector space C. I'm going to denote it as V of C, A, B. Sometimes this one is referred to as a fusion vector space because fusion space because you fuse two lines into one line. This is a splitting space. Okay. Now um, I'm going to claim without proof that these two vector spaces are dual to each other. Is uh, the dual of splitting the fusion spaces are dual. Um, this you can actually show from the axioms of 3D TKFT with you know, punctures, the one extended TKFT. Okay. But I'm going to just put it down as uh, without proving it. So what this means is that you can actually, well, what Dew tells you that you can form, we can pair them up, can form some pairing between them um, and get a complex number. So specifically, we should be able to make sense of these pictures. That's a pairing between the two vector space, right? So you can naturally pair them up like this. You have A, B, you have to pick some basis states for the junctions, but okay. And that should give us Pictures with only C line going naturally. If uh, we can, well, no, we should be able to shrink this torus or this handle here. More precisely, we have bodies in between the two punctured. We have bodies in between two manifolds, and that allow us to actually evaluate what this is to prove there's a pairing, non-degenerate pairing between the two vector spaces. That's, where, that's, that's why they are due to each other. So I'm going to normalize the vector space such that if I pick a basis for this junction to be new, and this is new, um, I'm going to normalize the vector, the basis of these two vector spaces so that this is the DC new is C, right? Or we can just write up and just draw a diagram. C, A, B, C is B, B, D, C. Okay. Yes? You can do that identification because you have the top 33D if I don't have a top 3D level, I wouldn't be able to prove that I have this identification. Um, even though in the, when we apply any on theory to a non-red basic system, which presumably doesn't have the 3D level, we will just still impose the same structure. Yeah. But in a 3D TKFT, fully 3D TKFT, we, we can prove this without you know, additional assumptions. And uh, another relation which is kind of inverse of this picture is that you can, um, here you can kill this leg, here you can shrink them. Okay. I have two lines A and B. It's, this is kind of like a resolution of identity. And have to sum over all the intermediate channels 
C mu. OK. Um, so these numbers are, I mean, this number in some sense is chosen arbitrarily. Uh, it's also for good reason. I mean, that will make the diagramming calculus easier. And here, this number must be the inverse of that number. Uh, it's some bases in the vector space, some also normal bases of the vector space. Okay, so now we also know what we should do on the um, on the splitting space, the other picture. Okay, uh, how much time? Uh, a minute Two minutes. And a half. Okay, all right. So I'll mention the last piece to complete the fusion part of the theory. The last piece about orientation. Oh, it's always an issue that you have to take care of. So, you know, in Atiyah's definition of TKFT, we want to assign a dual vector space to the manifold with opposite orientation. And we should extend it to manifold with labels, with punctured, labeled punctures. Okay, so. We should be able to relate these two vector space, sigma, and by du. Okay. If you think about these punctures as Wilson lines, reversing orientation means we revert, we are reversing the direction of the Wilson lines. Okay. So this is the same as being able to reverse the orientation of the Wilson line. But we need to be a little careful here. These two are not necessarily the same Wilson line. So we just say this is going to be a Wilson line that's due to A. A bar, B bar, C bar, etc. Okay. So this is the additional structure on the set of labels that each of them should have a due, which just means you should be able to reverse orientation Wilson line. And once you reverse orientation of the entire Manifold, we also reverse orientation of these lines. So that structure is imposed on the, on the category. Okay. okay, so just to quickly summarize, so we have a set of labels, and the labels form a category that allows us to do tensor product and direct sum. And there's a vector space associated with, for example, three puncture sphere from a cross B to C, et cetera. And this category has the structure of dual. You can take the dual of any of the objects, okay, and there's an, another object. This, this dual of A could be the same as A, okay, which allow us to reverse our rotation of Wilson line. Okay. Um, and that basically completes the theory of puncture spheres, essentially. What we, what we managed to do so far is to Kind of figure out you know, what we should do to the puncture spheres. Okay. And next time we'll discuss braiding, which arises from thinking about the morphism of puncture spheres. Okay. And that will complete this uh, kind of discussion of 3D TKFTs. All right, so I think I should stop here. Yeah, okay, that's, that's the braiding part. Um, we haven't gotten through that yet, but just to um, save some time for tomorrow. <laughs> no, no, okay. <laughs> um, so, so mathematically, the structure that we have defined so far is a structure of fusion category. No. So the, the structure that we have so far is a structure of fusion category. I mean, a unitary fusion category because you know, we are doing a unitary quantum field theory. And this is the same structure that you saw in Ifan's lecture on 2D CFTs. And this structure, in this, in this fusion category structure, so far, there's no reason that VABC, there's no reason that they are the same. They don't, they don't have to be the same. Okay? However, 
if we think about the 3D TKFT, then there's some additional properties which we'll discuss that will make these two isomorphic. Yeah. But everything that I've talked about so far is, is really just to find the fusion category, which doesn't really need to have a commutative fusion rule. All right, maybe one more. Well, I cannot, so I cannot prove that because that's a requirement. Could, could you repeat what oh, so the question is, can we prove all the inner products of pairing that we introduced so far is positive? Um, I cannot prove that because, you know, there are, mathematically, mathematically, there are theories there are fusion categories or even you know, 3D TKFTs that does not have just non-unit theories. But if we demand unitarity, we can, that will prove all the vector, all the inner products of in the positive definite. So that follows from unitarity. But there are TKFTs which are just not unitary. And that's fine that they don't arise as, you know, um, they don't arise as physical unitary quantum field series, but they exist mathematically as 3D TKFTs. All right, let's, uh, let's thank Meng one more time and let's have some coffee.